this point, I would uh, also like to point out there is a, a long three-week uh, workshop coming up at Hyderabad, uh, supported by International Brain Research Organization, Ibro UNESCO workshop on computational and theoretical neuroscience. Um, of course, unfortunately, the day is passed, but uh, there are events happening, and I think this is a very, very nice sign for uh, Indian scientists. <clears throat> I uh, work in uh, Department of Computer and Information Sciences, and I also am uh, associated with Center for Neural and Cognitive Sciences. Today, I would uh, like to, I guess, uh, the tea break was good in some sense. Now we are moving on to behavioral, right? Uh, it's a different, uh, this talk is in some sense related to sequencing motor actions and so on, but it's at a much higher level. We are studying the behavior uh, of this so-called implicit sequence learning. Uh, the, my, I have organized my talk uh, primarily, uh, uh, the first part as a kind of a tutorial on what is this implicit uh, learning and various paradigms, methods, and I'll briefly touch upon computational models so it is uh, uh, you know, it, it fits with the INCF framework. Uh, but these models have been very useful in understanding uh, implicit learning. And then today I would uh, particularly talk about uh, 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 the uh, role of attention, how, what attention, what role attention plays in implicit learning. And share some of the results that uh, uh, my student uh, who has done an MPhil thesis at our center Anuj Shukla, uh, the results from his thesis work on this theme. And at this point, I would also like to acknowledge, before I start, the uh, uh, help from uh, a hospital at Hyderabad, Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, allowing us to use their eye tracking facility. Although the study at this point was done only on uh, normal subjects, normal participants. So what is implicit learning? Well, uh, it has been quite hard to define, uh, and I'm quoting this from uh, an old survey from Axel Clearman's, but the situation remains more, pretty much similar uh, even at this point. Implicit learning is, uh, uh, it's, what is written here is not a definition, but uh, uh, a way to understand this, uh, it's incidental learning. Uh, learning, you are uh, uh, processing stimuli and there's something that happens within your system that's incidental um, and the ability, uh, broadly, ability to learn without awareness or uh, uh, we call learning is implicit when we acquire new information without actually setting out to do so, without really intending to do so and in such a way that the resulting knowledge is difficult to describe or express. That you possess the knowledge, but uh, you know, when I ask you, can you describe what you learned, it will not be able to describe or, uh, or express. So uh, to kind of uh, summarize, this is the uh, learning where we know more than we can tell or describe. Uh, contrasting this with implicit learning to kind of make it, uh, 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 make our idea of implicit learning more grounded. In explicit learning, in, for example, tasks like uh, learning how to solve a problem or learning a concept, it is typically hypothesis driven and uh, fully conscious as opposed to what happens in implicit learning. And uh, in uh, there are uh, abundant uh, examples in uh, real life of uh, learning implicitly. Uh, two of them I put down for their uh, importance. Language acquisition and use involves a large, large part of language acquisition and use uh, involves implicit learning. And in general, skill learning has uh, this, you learn how to ride a bicycle and I ask you now, give me a description of what happens, right? So you cannot uh, give me how you are able to ride a bicycle, right? So you have, but you can demonstrate it. Um, so there are uh, 
going on uh, to distinguish from other areas of study, particularly subliminal perception research, where there has been a lot of work on priming and, uh, and priming by subliminal stimuli. In, in implicit learning, typically the stimuli are uh, supraliminal as opposed to the subliminal perception research. And similarly, implicit memory research, there's a large body of work on memory being implicit uh, uh, aspects of memory. So uh, unlike that, what uh, characterizes and distinguishes implicit learning is uh, that this learning is sensitive to structural relationship between stimulus items, not as much to specific stimuli themselves. So what follows what? The relationship is what uh, is emphasized. Now, there are three major paradigms uh, in implicit learning. Uh, common paradigms for studying, investigating implicit learning, artificial grammar learning, dynamic control task, and sequence learning. I'll give you a brief idea what these are. Uh, back in 60s, uh, Reber proposed this artificial grammar learning. On the right hand side, you see a finite state grammar, where uh, the way to understand this, there is an input. This uh, machine generates strings of letters starting from the in, in state and ending at the out state. And it generates following these arcs, and every time it uh, tra transits in these circles are called states of this system. This is uh, in uh, uh, in other uh, language, this is called finite state automaton, where you go from state to state and uh, generate the symbol that is resident on the arc. So for example, you visit this uh, particular path, you generate T, uh, P, right? So T, and if you stay in this state, you can generate P, then uh, transit from here to here, T, T, P, T, S, and uh, that is a valid sequence from this. So this generates a huge number of sequences. The idea is that this particular um, uh, schema is behind sequences. From this, one can uh, generate sequences that follow this particular schema and also generate uh, uh, schema uh, sequences that do not uh, subscribe or conform to this particular grammar. Right? So this setting. People are asked to memorize, you generate some sample sequences, and I have a better view of this in the next slide, where you, from this finite state grammar, you generate sequences, and uh, there have been diff variety of paradigms in one of them. For example, you can use this sequence to, so in this case, if you see, there are five symbols, T, S, X, uh, P, and K. Right? So there are five locations corresponding to each of these letters, generate the sequence, and what the subjects see is a stimulus that appears at one of these five locations per trial, and all they have to do is press the corresponding button corresponding to that stimulus location. And as they do this, they practice the sequence that's basically coming out of this. And there are grammatical sequences. They do many trials of this. And uh, there's implicit learning that ensures. And there, are, there is a test trial where you are given a grammatical string. You are given a string. You don't know whether it follows. We tell the subjects uh, that uh, after uh, they go through this, they are asked to memorize a set of training strings. Then they are informed that there is a grammar that generated these strings. Now, can you, given new strings, can you classify them into what they think follows what they have seen or does not follow? Basically, uh, a judgment of grammaticality and ungrammaticality. And this, so these are examples of strings that follow grammar and those that are generated by uh, switching at least one or uh, several letters from the uh, valid strings. So it has been observed in this paradigm. For example, people uh, are not able to articulate what they have learned, but their performance on this uh, grammaticality judgment is way above chance level, indicating uh, something that they have acquired, but uh, implicitly that they cannot describe. So this is one very popular paradigm. The other paradigm is uh, dynamic control task, again, uh, 
uh, an old one, 1980s. Berry and Broadbent uh, 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 proposed this, where subjects uh, interact with a simulated system. Example, in this case, they are controlling a sugar, sugar factory production. And what they have to do is, on each trial, subjects can hire or fire workers to maintain certain level of sugar production. So in this panel, you need to enter next level of workforce to maintain the production level of, uh, say, 9,000 or whatever. The current output is 8,000, but the target is 9,000. And they need to adjust something within the system to maintain this. And it has been observed that the subjects are pretty good at maintaining Although uh, the underlying uh, behavior is governed by an equation that is unknown to the subjects, they can pretty much guess, but they cannot articulate at the end of the, uh, the task, but they, can, uh, they show behavior uh, which mimics this uh, equation that governs this relationship between the number of the production and the number of workforce, for example. So these are called dynamic control tasks. This is one paradigm, again, used for studying implicit learning. The other very popular uh, paradigm which studies sequence learning is introduced by uh, Nissan and Bulemer back in 1980s, late 80s. This is uh, popularly known as serial reaction time task. And let us see what happens in this. In this task, participants respond. There is a display on which the stimulus appears. Just as I have shown in the artificial grammar, there is a display there is, a, a, in this case, one of the four locations is highlighted by an asterisk. And subjects uh, simply have to press the corresponding button on the keypad. And these, uh, these sequence of stimuli appear, and unknown to the participants, there is an underlying pattern that these, these series of asterisks follow. It's not known or given to them, but by responding sequentially to the stimuli, subjects uh, become experienced in this uh, unknown sequence. And there are two groups in the original study. There is a group that uh, is given random sequence of stimuli that they do not show any improvement in the reaction time to average reaction time stays pretty much fixed for uh, stimuli over number of blocks. The other uh, uh, group that is exposed to this uh, repeating sequence, their response time increases, indicating they are learning something predictive about how st stimuli follow one another. And, uh, and at the end of this, when you debrief, when you ask the subjects, can you, for example, generate uh, or give, uh, and I'll talk about uh, methods of eliciting or understanding what knowledge has been acquired by subjects. So when you debrief the subjects, subjects deny any knowledge of any repeating pattern. Right? So that's the hallmark of implicit learning. OK, so this is another view of that. Uh, typically, uh, what uh, is done is uh, you give uh, 12 trials of training trials where the sequence uh, stays constant. The response time uh, shows an improvement. There's indicating something is being learned. There's, there are learning predictions. And in the 13th block, typically, you change the sequence to another uh, uh, unknown or unseen one, untrained one, and the reaction time goes up. And when you introduce the sequence again, it comes back to the level where they were before. So this is typically, and the effect size in this case is the amount of uh, the reaction time difference between the blocks that, uh, that are adjacent to this before and after. What is the average reaction time here versus this? This difference is kind of an index of how much uh, uh, learning happened within this. So again, uh, the typical uh, behavior here is that subjects deny knowing the, that the stimuli followed a particular sequence or any sequence. OK, so uh, the other uh, issue within this implicit learning literature is uh, how do we establish knowledge, uh, some knowledge acquired and that resides implicitly? There are three major ways of doing this within the literature. Verbal reports from the subjects, forced choice tests. These are more objective 
and subjective tests. Uh, the, in the free report, uh, uh, this uh, paradigm introduced by Matthews, you have uh, two groups of subjects. One, original subjects called original. They are exposed to grammatical strings. You know, remember that AGL paradigm, artificial grammar learning paradigm. Training phase, then they classified new strings in the test phase. After every 10 classification decisions, they were asked, can you give some instructions of how you are classifying? Right? So they give some things, T should follow R or whatever, and use those instructions, give those instructions to so-called yoked subjects that follow these instructions, and uh, they classify the same stimuli. And it appears the original subjects were always about 30% better than yoked subjects. Say, you know, meaning that whatever knowledge they are expressing is not, uh, you know, reliable enough for the yoked subjects to classify test strings, but their performance itself is superior. So they are using knowledge that they do not have access to, in some sense. This is one way to um, uh, test this the free report version of uh, elicitation of the knowledge. The forced choice tests, which are uh, the uh, tests of choice in most of SRT tasks, force the subject to respond regardless of confidence and make sure that there are appropriate cues present uh, so that the test is sensitive to uh, this knowledge that they've acquired. So for example, after training on grammatical strings, participants are asked to classify new strings. After each classification, subjects underline the part of the string that makes it ungrammatical. For example, if this is the string and TR is what is ungrammatical, they f an outline that this is what, this what makes it ungrammatical. For example, TR cannot occur uh, starting in the second location. If that's what uh, is, this, so this is more objective uh, and there are several uh, methods of doing this uh, uh, objective way. and the other one which I will not discuss too much but subjective measures where the basic idea is uh, you know the the issue that we need to keep in mind absence of uh, discrimination performance is good evidence for absence of conscious knowledge but uh, uh, but presence of the discrimination performance is not good enough for uh, you know, uh, conscious uh, knowledge being acquired. So you need uh, measure in this, this subjective measure, you need a, a measure that is tuned to conscious knowledge rather than any kind of knowledge, right? So uh, subjective measures are one other way. Now moving on, we discussed so far uh, various paradigms, various methods of eliciting. Now, what are the mechanisms that perhaps are, that underlie this uh, type of implicit learning? Taking artificial grammar learning as a paradigm for implicit learning. So these are sequences, ignore all these boxes. But these are various uh, grammatical strings generated from the finite state grammar. There are four, uh, broadly four, various, four mechanisms that are proposed uh, from a computational perspective. The first one is a rule abstraction approach. Basically, given these uh, strings, you um, have a learner, learning algorithm that uh, picks up regularities, rules within this. So uh, sim uh, some sort of a symbolic knowledge is generated from the, uh, in the form of production rules or discrimination trees or a classifier. So for example, in this, the, your uh, rule learning algorithm can pick up, if the string begins with T or P, then it is a grammatical string. So that kind of rule could be extracted. So people said this is perhaps what is, what underlies implicit learning. Although it is not this, this rule knowledge is not accessible to the subjects, but that's what is acquired implicitly. The second major uh, approach is fragment-based and chunking approaches. These exploit uh, redundancies in the training material, right? So they uh, look at, uh, if, you know, what is a chunk that repeats in many of these sequences in the training example. So VPX is a pattern that occurs in uh, several of these strings, and this kind of fragment-based approach picks up database of such 
you know, subsequences that underlie grammatical sequences, and use this to classify the new strings that come. Right. So this is one uh, paradigm. The other is uh, exemplar-based approach where the whole instances are memorized during training and new exemplars are classified, you have some sort of a similarity metric that directly uh, compares these strings and uh, gives a score of how likely it is to going to be a grammatical string based on this example database. The final one, most uh, powerful approach and a uh, uh, lot of work in this area is distributional and statistical approaches, including neural network models. What they develop some sort of a model of the underlying statistical constraints present in the, the sequence of letters. So uh, uh, using associative learning mechanisms, one example is uh, Elman's simple recurrent network. This is used for uh, mimicking uh, AGL, uh, AGL type of uh, uh, string learning. So in this, uh, in this uh, approach, current element, it, uh, it, uh, it's a, uh, uh, Elman's simple recurrent network is a three-layered uh, uh, backpropagation type of learning method where you have uh, input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. And hidden layer uh, has this kind of a one-to-one -one copy of the previous activations are kept in a context layer. And this combines with the next input. And as you can see, as time goes on, the temporal window in which this context looks at increases. Uh, so uh, uh, and uh, as it learns, this uh, temporal window looks at uh, uh, the relationship between successive items. So what this, after learning what this network is able to do, given the current element, it has a prediction what follows next. And the knowledge within this ne network is uh, implicit in the sense of uh, it, uh, you know, being distributed over the weights of the network. Although this is a supervised learning approach, there are other methods Pro proposed in the literature which work on uh, unsupervised or self-organizing type of uh, approaches. For example, uh, people used uh, autoencoder type of networks to learn uh, these uh, grammatical strings. OK, so, um, so, so far we looked at uh, uh, different aspects of implicit learning Today, what I would like to focus on is uh, the role of attention in implicit learning. And uh, uh, this is very important because what we have been saying is that uh, implicit learning happens automatically. It doesn't require attentional resources. Right? So if uh, it is automatic and uh, it engages some independent system, it should be possible to obtain learning even in conditions where attention is engaged, for example, in a secondary task. So I load the system with uh, another, so uh, basically put the subject in a dual task paradigm, where they are following the stimuli in the SRT, but they are also doing an additional task, which uh, engages the attentional system. And uh, typically, the secondary task requires subjects to keep running count of, uh, for example, tones being presented ask you, uh, give a cumulative count of tones of certain frequency, high frequency or low frequency, right? So um, the idea is that if it is really, uh, it does not in, uh, engage attentional resources, you should have pretty much no impairment in sequence learning. Now, the current uh, literature is very uh, equivocal about the role of attention. Overall, what the position people have taken is IL is uh, in implicit learning is relatively robust in the face of distraction. Uh, many studies that point out this, IL uh, perhaps uh, processes possibly occur in parallel with additional processes that are more dependent on the availability of attention, intention, and so on. Right? So this is the view. but. A uh, recent finding of Shanks and Shannon, it claims that attentional demands really, uh, they, uh, they have shown in a task 
that it impairs implicit learning. So still there is some uh, inconclusive uh, um, nature of uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the role played by attention in implicit learning. What we decided to do is uh, two things. One, look at this uh, implicit learning in oculomotor system and also probe the role of attention. So oculomotor, uh, uh, I'll skip this, uh, uh, the result of uh, Shannon, but I'll come back to if there is a, a basic uh, thing that they have shown is, uh, you remember now, by now you're familiar with this kind of a graph where you have blocks, the up to, to 11 blocks of training and 12 tests, 13, 14, they come back. And in dual or single, in single repeating uh, sequence paradigm, you get the classic uh, SRT effect. But when you load up the system with a dual task, whether the sequence uh, repeats or whether the sequence follows some sort of probabilistic, uh, uh, it's not a fixed sequence, but it follows same probabilities that the original. In both conditions, the effect, if you introduce a new sequence, there is no, uh, so subjects do not uh, show this kind of a rebound uh, increase in the RT, right? So oculomotor uh, uh, SRT, there is relatively less work in this. Uh, basically, you ask subjects to move their eye, you know, so the saccadic system is doing implicit learning and look at if you get similar effects. One study in 2007, basically follows the classic paradigm, except now in this, the stimulus and the response are directed to the same location, right? So this mapping is maximally, uh, you know, con uh, compatible. Whereas in the other case, manual paradigms, typically you have uh, display, uh, you know, visual stimulation, and then the motor response is on another response uh, uh, system. So we used our, uh, in this paradigm, Kinder uh, 2007, they have uh, uh, given a sequence uh, that follows this location. These numbers are, uh, I guess, numbered 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, like this. And what is shown is a sequence of 12 locations where subjects uh, make a saccade to that location. Now what they have shown in the study that oculomotor system also exhibits SRT, right? So this uh, implicit learning uh, and the classic SRT effect is observed. Uh, however, what we saw is that there are uh, some uh, methodological issues with this study, so we wanted to address those and then use this paradigm to study the role of attention. So do we, for example, uh, see attention impairs oculomotor uh, implicit learning or not. But before doing that, uh, there are a couple of issues that we had to address that in their study, there was no control group that uh, 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 is exposed to, sub, for example, a random sequence. And then uh, the other was they used a tone because uh, you don't have control on eye movements and you have the stimulus, you have to direct your attention there and there is an infrared camera that is tracking your eye location. So you don't know whether you have fixated your saccade, landed on the stimulus location or not. So in order to um, give a feedback, what they have done is if it doesn't land in an area near the stimulus location, they give a beep and then the subject has to make a corrective saccade. Now, this kind of intervention in a, a task like this can, Im, can have uh, really an impact on implicit learning. Anything you do within the task can have an impact on implicit processes. So what we did is uh, remove that. We have uh, what is called uh, an area of interest around this. As soon as the saccade lands in that area of interest, we uh, the display shifts to the next stimulus and they have to make a next saccade. So this saccade sequence is what we uh, recorded. This is uh, an example.
So this is the actual recording. Uh, subject uh, only sees the black dot that uh, the other colored dot is for our purpose, right? So they don't get any feedback. And sometimes the saccade doesn't land. And in our case, what we said is that this, this uh, stimulus doesn't move to the next location unless it registers the saccade in that. So it stays on. It's a cue to the subject. They have to make a corrective saccade. So we eliminated this tone uh, as a way of feedback. And that gave a, actually a, a much bigger effect. I don't show the comparative. So this is the eye tracking uh, system that we use from the Nizans Institute. And uh, uh, similarly arranged in this uh, uh, diamond shape. And uh, we took uh, the same sequences. And uh, there's a familiarization phase, training phase, and then the recall phase, which is where we take a a combination of free verbal report and uh, objective type of measure, right? So we looked at this, and the results show that. Uh, so these are the two groups in experiment one. We had uh, uh, one group that uh, uh, sees uh, fixed sequence, the other group that sees random sequence of uh, locations, and they do not show any sort of uh, the average. Uh, reaction time uh, stays around 310 milliseconds. And then you see this classic uh, effect uh, uh, when you move from the training sequence to the, the new test sequence. You see a, uh, an increase in the re reaction time. And it comes back uh, when you introduce the original sequence. So, uh, so what? Uh, uh, when uh, we do the debrief uh, using a questionnaire, what we show subjects are unaware of a repeating sequence. And this particular uh, paradigm is very good, unlike the vis visual one. It's very fast, 100 millisecond. Uh, and uh, the implicit learning can be very effective um, because uh, it is so fast, it goes so fast, there is no really uh, danger. Uh, that they uh, can actually guess what's happening. And in the second uh, experiment, we uh, introduced tones, tone counting task additional to this. And uh, what we see, our results, uh, is that this is the, uh, the uh, group that's doing tone counting. This is no tone. Of course, there is a, a, a price being paid for doing two tasks together. But what you see is a robust uh, SRT effect. Even with tone counting, they show sensitivity. When you introduce a new sequence, there is an increase in RT, right? indicating that they have uh, are, uh, realized it is not the same sequence. Right? So there is no predictive. I mean, there's, they are as predictive in the, in the dual task as, as uh, in the case of uh, the single task. Right, so these are all uh, some uh, details of uh, those results. And we also uh, calculate what is called a D score, which is the difference in the reaction times between the test block and the average of the two blocks that pre and post, uh, 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 that are located pre and post the test block. And you see that. Uh, Although we see a slight difference, but it's not statistically significant between the two groups, the difference is large between when they are doing a new sequence versus when they are exposed to the training sequence, indicating again there is a knowledge that is acquired implicitly. Uh, so our conclusion, implicit learning unaffected by attentional demands in the oculomotor SRT. Um, and this is just one more thing just to show that uh, the difference between the actual count and the count generated by the subject is close to, you know, where the difference is very minimal. So meaning that they are doing the second task also equally well. And they are not just ignoring the tone counting. OK, to summarize, uh, experiment one establishes, in our opinion, uh, methodologically uh, more robust 
way of showing oculomotor system also undergo implicit learning. And not very surprising, but just uh, uh, that uh, I think this kind of paradigm is very powerful. Um, and second is um, is that that uh, this is uh, so our result adds weight to this camp that says attention really does not uh, uh, attentional demands do not impair implicit learning. So you have these two positions, and the current results point to perhaps a parallel independent system that uh, engages when uh, you are experiencing series of stimuli and uh, acquiring internally some relationship uh, among the stimuli. So uh, in conclusion, what I have done today is uh, to show you that, uh, well, uh, a given uh, tutorial overview of what is this implicit learning research. Implicit learning is fundamental and ubiquitous process in cognition. And from information processing perspective, it's best characterized as a kind of complex form of priming, such that distributional knowledge acquired through incidental experience with the series of stimuli can influence processing or performance in the absence of explicit awareness. In the and uh, there are a couple of open questions that we are interested. Uh, perhaps uh, port this to EEG and if possible to functional MRI to study separate brain system. There is again a lot of work in this area, but uh, not much focused in oculomotor paradigm. And uh, the other issue which is of interest for to us is the role of implicit learning in cognitive development. You know, the ability to sequence stimuli is fundamental uh, to many uh, cognitive capacities that develop over uh, uh, during the developmental stages, including language acquisition. All of these are, have highly stylized sequential behavior. So tracking this over the developmental profile, seeing, you know, particularly in uh, uh, children uh, that exhibit variety of uh, uh, developmental disorders, learning disorders, uh, and some uh, other uh, developmental disorders, this could be an index of, this is like stimulus in a domain independent, a domain general index of sequencing ability, and see if it uh, correlates with some of the uh, issues that the children are facing, right, within development. Uh, thank you for your attention. Interesting that attentional demands don't interfere with implicit learning. And I thought maybe this system could be productively used trying to figure out what um, kind of neurotransmitter systems might modulate implicit learning. For example, can you do these tasks in the presence of drugs like caffeine, which is thought maybe to enhance learning, or nicotine, or narcotics? Right. To see uh, things that would affect awareness but may not affect or maybe enhance uh, implicit learning. Yeah, very good suggestion. I've, I've actually t uh, totally not covered anything about uh, neural correlates or what uh, uh, partly I'm not aware of that uh, part of the literature. Uh, I'll take this suggestion. Very nice. Uh, way to manipulate uh, this aspect and see what happens to the implicit process. Huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I was just wondering if it's worth uh, measuring the you know, the pupil diameter along with the whole. If there's a, a correlate of attention. Correlate of? Of attention, you know, if it's you know, the locus ceruleus kind of. So you could actually, while you're doing the tracking, you could actually measure the size of the pupil. Pupil diameter, right? On your right. Okay. Just see that there is, or it's independent. Right. Thank you.
multitasking is something that many people anyway do uh, most of the time. Uh, but within that, if learning is happening uh, while the other tasks are anyway being conducted, so I think you are, are you referring to subcortical or cortical processes? If you say that there are two separate or parallel circuits, neural circuits engaged in this. Yes. I think child sort of starts with implicit learning and then in the school they are made explicit learning and people sometimes criticize that. Uh, so please uh, convey your thoughts on that. Right. Yeah, there's a, actually a nice review paper uh, that I have not really put uh, by Tim Curran in 2007, I think, where he tried to uh, uh, look at the current literature on the neural correlates of implicit learning. So one of the points that comes out is basal ganglia, for example, is, uh, is very much involved in uh, implicit learning. In that sense, this talk uh, you know, really goes with the rest of the talk that this morning. But, uh, and uh, cortical circuits are involved more in explicit. And there is also some uh, uh, debate about the role of hippocampus versus basal ganglia in this. Right? So uh, I'm not uh, completely uh, aware of that uh, area of work. But yeah, the next thing that I put up open areas is brain systems involved in this. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you very much, Babiraju. And, uh, <clears throat>